How about Marston Case? Marston didn't know that he maybe would be on the agenda until we met on the way to the boat today. Come and tell a story or two. Okay. Thank you. It's nice to be among all my old neighbors from Island Park. I was I lived here on Island Park from about 19 31 to 56, say, over in Avalon, the other end of uh, Manchester Lane from the Iversons, corner of Manchester and uh, Tuxedo Boulevard. And uh, I wouldn't uh, be coming to your reunion today if it weren't for my mother, Antoinette Case, which many of you knew, uh, or Tony Case, her nickname was Tony, and she did a lot of things at Mound and for the island. And so I'll tell you briefly how she happened to come on Island Park. Uh, she was living in Minneapolis. She worked in the flour mills, Washburn Crosby, and uh, somehow got the idea around 1918, just at the end of the second, uh, First World War, to build a, to buy a lot on Island Park. So she did buy a lot, and she got lumber from barracks that they were tearing down in Fort Snelling at the end of the war and brought that out and built a little house, a cottage, a shack really. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, we called it the shack. <laughs> but she enjoyed that a great deal to have just a little house. It was in the Avalon Association. It was just there on the corner of Cumberland Lane which is gone now, but Cumberland Land in Tuxedo. And uh, subsequently she went to college, or when she went to a divinity school at the University of Chicago, where she met my father. And so I think that her story was to my father, who was Clyde Case, who some of you know also, uh, that she had this wonderful real estate out on Island Park. <laughs> <laughs> And so they came up and looked at it and so on, and they subsequently married. And uh, I think their honeymoon was out at the shack. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that little piece of land, we sort of identified with Island Park. And subsequently, in the 30s, we were the caretakers of Tippy Walken, which was, the, uh, it was a church-affiliated uh, camp for a church in Minneapolis, a Christian church called something. And they would come out in the summer and they would fill up this place. I mean, it had like 30, 40 rooms in there. It was a wonderful place to be the son of the caretaker because he had umpteen rooms and a huge land area. This was on the site of the old Woolner Hotel. The Woolner Hotel had burned down and I'm not sure who it was. I think we should all be asking these little historical things so we get some of this more, more of this data. When did the Wilner Hotel burn down? I would say since this was there in the 1930s, maybe it burned down around 1915 or 1920. But on that site was built Tippy Walken. And uh, so we lived there. My dad bought a cow, and I don't know, we had a cow and some chickens and stuff. It was kind of like a farm, really. But we lived there for several years, and then we moved over to uh, the corner of Manchester and uh, Tuxedo which was called Cozy Corner. I mean, every little house, every little uh, cottage out there had the, a name of something or other. There was a place called You Need a Rest, and <laughs> <laughs> over by Pembroke Grocery. And so we lived in Cozy Corner uh, for some years. Uh, and then uh, at Cozy Corner, it was uh, a great place be just in a little neighborhood there. And I would go to school, my sister and brother, now my brother was born a little later, but my sister and I went to Spring Park School. Some of the people on the island, the kids went to Spring Park School, which is a little two-room schoolhouse uh, just over with the entrance to Casco Point, that road that goes up there. You, you know, in the corner where there's a big church school right now. That's where the uh, Spring Park School was, and the Spring Park School was moved over and is used as a Spring Park Town Hall now. It's over uh, 
whatever it is called, Harrison's Bay is in the, in the back there. So that was great, a two-room two schoolhouse, two teachers, it's a wonderful kind of country effect. And I went to Mound High School, I graduated from Mound in 1945. My parents lived here all their lives, uh, and they died in 1988, 1995. My mother was quite, she was 104 when she died, but she left a long heritage uh, at Highland Park. And you can ask me any more questions. I can't talk too long because we've got a lot of people who could talk to you about their experiences on Island Park. Thank you. All right, we're going to move now from the 20s into the next decade or so. And Jim Ogland is our next person. Jim. Again, with thanks to Jim for designing our program. Some of my most uh, memorable and vivid memories of growing up are those while living on the island. My parents, my brother, and I moved uh, from Minneapolis to the island in the summer of 1939. I was in the third grade. We had a cottage near Shoning's Grocery and uh, the summers were spent swimming at uh, Chester Park. Uh, we'd get up in the morning, uh, have a little bite to eat, grab a swimming suit and a towel, walk on the blacktop down barefoot uh, down to Chester Park and swim until noon and come home for lunch, uh, go back to Chester Park and swim until it got dark. So we had you know, wonderful summers. We lived there about three years and it was, uh, it was a great life. We also swam at uh, Brighton Commons, which was right down the hill behind Shoning's Grocery. That's like grim story later became. Um, it, at that time, the shoreline was all bulrushes and, and uh, cattails, about 75 feet out from shore. We had a flat bottom rowboat uh, kind of stashed away in the bulrushes there, and we used to row it occasionally up and down the shoreline. Almost every day, there was a middle-aged woman a rather portly woman that swam there. And she, I always remember she had a white bathing, rubber bathing cap on and a black wool suit. And she would uh, float and she f often fell asleep while she was floating. <laughs> so one day we tied a rope on her and, uh, with, with a flat bottom rowboat, we towed her down through the Witchwood Bridge. <laughs> down the channel a little ways and turned her loose, drifted. And, uh, you know, I thought about that a thousand times, wondering what she thought when she woke up. And, uh, and, uh, she wasn't the worse for it because the next day she was back floating and snoring again. <laughs> we also used to jump uh, from the whip Witchwood Bridge, and I'll never forget there was a huge carp that swam underneath the bridge. We had to be very careful not to jump on him. We, we named him Monstro, and he, and he was big. As kids, we had a lot of good times on the island. The Fourth of July, of course, was always a, a fun time. Uh, all the stores, including Shonings and the one across the street, sold fireworks. Uh, we had uh, Roman candles, sparklers, black cats, lady fingers, and some cherry bombs. Lady Fingers, some of you may remember there were little tiny firecrackers that you could hold be between your fingers and they, they wouldn't, you could light them and they wouldn't hurt you at all. Billy Gunnell was one of our neighborhood friends um, whom many of you have probably read something about recently as he's written a number of articles for the Historical Society magazine newsletter. Uh, he's the same one who some years ago organized uh, annual group of people calling themselves the Island Rats. And uh, he uh, he's, uh, sends his regrets. He's unable to be here with us today. He lives down in the southern part of the United States somewhere. But back to the fireworks. Billy Grunnell was always a daredevil. He put two or three of those lady fingers between his teeth <laughs> and lit them and blew all his front teeth out. <laughs> 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 that might be an exaggeration, but he did crack his lips. And, uh, 
And, I, and I'm sure he had some loose teeth. He didn't smile for a long time. Uh, I, I uh, recently told you that if I was told recently that if you lived on the island, you you were automatically an island rat until you, you jumped off the red bridge. Now, I just heard again this morning, somebody contradicted that and said, you couldn't be an island rat unless you jumped off the red bridge. <laughs> so whatever it was, uh, there are some island rats here that uh, some of them got a pin that, or button that we made. Uh, this is the bridge. The red bridge is the one that connects uh, Island Park to Enchanted Island. It seems like everyone has an Island Park story. Uh, while I was having coffee just this morning, uh, a friend told me that in the early 1940s, he rented a cottage on uh, Douglas Beach, a honeymoon cottage, and then he got married and went on a honeymoon up north, some lake for a couple of days. When he came back, he hadn't been home a few minutes, but a friend, a co-worker, drove in the driveway and said, I got bad news. Your draft notice came while you were gone. <laughs> and he said, well, didn't you try to get me an extension? Yeah, we did, but it's only three days. <laughs> well, let's move on to the Roaring Twenties. There was no time really in American history that was anything like the Roaring Twenties. This was the jazz age and the Charleston was in full swing. Marathon dancing was being held everywhere. Women smoked. They wore flapper dresses and had their hair cut short and bobbed. And rouge and lipstick was becoming respectable. Americans, including Island Park people, were ready to experiment with personal freedoms. The automobile was, was coming on strong. Model T Ford could be bought for less than three, $300. When the 20s started, there were nearly 7 million cars already in the United States. And by the time that Henry Ford brought out his Model A in 1927, there were three times that many, 21 million cars. Aviation was becoming a real business and changing from barnstorming to transporting mail and pass carrying passengers. American culture was literally exploding. The 20s saw a tremendous change in America, on the island, and throughout the world. For better or worse, the Roaring Twenties caused a profound liberalization of personal behavior. In 1923, the residents of Island Park uh, voted 131 to 79 against incorporation. The summer population at that time was about 3,000. A year later, in 1924, on November the 8th, Island Park Incorporated. They had their own mayor, their own constable, and their own justice of the peace. By 1925, the island was pretty much all developed. All the subdivisions had been platted, and most of the hundreds of lots uh, had been sold. Someone once said that the island, on the island, there, there's a house behind every tree. And that certainly is probably true. All the, good, all the old rules seemed to be vanishing in the 20s. Times were good, in many ways a good time to be alive. It was gaudy but nice. For many years, the temperance movement had attempted to improve the moral fiber of America by outlining, outlawing alcohol. Their efforts finally culminated in the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, making it against the law to produce or consume alcohol in any quantity. Prohibition went into effect January 16, 1920. Immediately thereafter, organized criminals such as John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, and ordinary citizens began making bootleg alcohol for profit. <coughs> Many citizens patronized bootleggers, made atrocious gin in bathtubs, and worse beer in the basement. Lake Minnetonka residents, including island dwellers, many of them summer residents, disagreed with prohibition and frequented local speakeasies, of which there apparently were a number of them on the lake. Numerous items printed in the local paper, that would have been the Mound Pilot, indicated that speakeasies were very popular places and that authorities made frequent raids on them to, to, in order to uphold the law. The articles in the paper state that bootleggers, who often were referred to as leggers, were using fast boats on the lake uh, to avoid apprehension. 
It was also reported that the boats were trafficking in liquor on Cook's Bay. I know a couple of a couple of speakeasy houses that were former speakeasies uh, up in um, the Heights and along the shore there. Prohibition was finally repealed in the, by the 21st Amendment in 1933. The Roaring 20s were a wonderful time, but it had to end and did so with a market crash in 1929. The island went on to become year-round living for hundreds of families, and it was and is a very special and unique place. Uh, it was the Roaring Twenties were like no other time, and thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now my next fellow here, I haven't met. Yes, thank you. Can you speak right up to the microphone. Mom, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are probably not more than three or four people in this room that remember Chester Park. But, uh, oh! <laughs> well, it was the most interesting place. Uh, probably as small an area as any place on the island. And uh, there were maybe a total of 12 people around. But we, uh, my sisters and I grew up there. I graduated from Mount High School. And that is about the extent of it. Uh, uh, Chester Park itself was very, very small area. Uh, it's hard to, hard to think now how they could have maintained a grocery store in that location with that population in those days. Uh, very, very few people. But uh, prices were high, so that probably helped a good deal. <laughs> There's not a lot more I can tell you about it, except it was a wonderful, wonderful area to grow up because there were so few people. The whole island, uh, oh, I'm sure there are more people in the room here than there were on the entire island. <laughs> oh, I'm certain. At our table, I think that was a step. <laughs> Six of us. I don't know why I'm here because, frankly, uh, that's about as much as I can tell you about Island Park. <laughs> Unless you'd like to know some of the prices that they charge for Wheaties and such. Uh, I don't know about that. There's very little I do know. <laughs> um, is Don Cox here? Yes. I saw him. Hi, Don. Just wanted to say hello. <laughs> Would somebody get the hook and get me off of your place? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's actually the only reason they wanted me to MC because I said, I ain't got a hook. <laughs> now we'll have Sandy Sherman come talk about Pembroke Park. Sally, where are you? Sally. Sally. Stand right up to it, right up like that. To which one? This one. That one? Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, my grandparents, May and Alfred Shervin, moved to Island Park in early in the early 1930s. And their first home was on Edsel Road, also known as Douglas Beach. They had three children, Marjorie born in 1916, Alfred in 1921, and Don in 1928. We love the pictures of them in their 20s style bathing attire. We know they lived in that house until the late 30s because my dad, Al, remembers playing football the lengthwise on the beach during the drought of the mid-30s. He also remembered uh, digging a basement under the house. Coincidentally, my husband Jim and I purchased that same house in 1966 and remodeled it. The basement was about half dug out. <laughs> The same fieldstone wall is still standing today, separating the beach from the yard. My grandparents then purchased the property at Pembroke on what is now known as Island View Drive. The house was attached to the store. It was a full service grocery with a meat market in the back and canned goods and ice cream in the front. There was a long counter across the front with a cash register. Although I remember that most people had a charge account and paid monthly. I found a letter that my grandmother wrote to my mom right after I was born on July 31st, 1943.
My parents were living in Milwaukee while my father worked for Toledo Scale. So I'm just going to read a little excerpt. And she's saying that she got the call that I was born um, in the, on a hot Saturday. And she says, Dad had gone up to Bonnie to see if he could scare up a little more butter. So I was all alone, and I sure got excited for a minute. Donald went into town to see the aqua parade with some kids, and Dad and I were so busy we just didn't have a minute's rest. We have had plenty of butter until last Wednesday. The government shut down on all the creameries without any notice, and they were only allowed to give their customers just so much. A lot less than we should have had, but so it made it kind of bad. But I suppose it will work out all right. The public will have to get along on less. It has been terribly hot here for the last few days. If the weather wasn't quite so warm, we wouldn't get so tired, as it's the heat that gets you down. There has been some talk of not opening the schools until September 20th. So, um, right across from the store was the park and the community house, where Don was married in 1948. Bev and Al were married in 1940, and after living in Milwaukee and serving in the Navy as a gunner's mate, they returned to Island Park and rented a small cottage on Inverness Road. They purchased a house on Devon and Tuxedo that was previously a store. However, they never ran it as a store. After Don returned from the Navy, the brothers opened a gas station where Henderson Station is now. They also had school buses and an ambulance service and I almost forgot, they also had a daily mail route into Minneapolis. Every day, Mom would often have to go down and pump gas if both brothers were gone at the same time. I remember Mom saying, why can't we be like other families and not always have school buses, tow trucks, and for a while, an army duck parked in the driveway? <laughs> the duck was used at water ski shows that my father and Pat Guy owned, and then they used the duck as an added attraction for rides. I think all of my Island Park friends have fond memories of swimming at Pembroke Beach and going to Grandpa's for popsicles after. And as an added bonus, we could go across the street to Croucher's and speed the squirrels <laughs> that he kept in a cage. There were three ways I could get to the store from Devon. Tuxedo, which was the highway, through the woods, which was the shortcut, or the scenic route on Island View Drive where all my friends lived. And my friends are here. Patty. Uh, Skindelen and Linda Speaker, who husband for, or father for a while was mayor, and Bunny Allen, she's here, and my first boyfriend, Leo Lally, is here, <laughs> and my good buddy over there, Buddy Patton, who lived across the street, and Dick Fenton, my good friend Sue's brother. So it's just so much fun to see all these people. So anyway, um, the extra lot next to Grandpa's store was on Clyde was. Um, an extra lot that they always have pick up softball games and baseball games and things, so that was really fun. Okay, after May passed away, Grandpa continued to run the store for about six years. Don built a new house on the property and kept the old house as a rental. He was living in the house when he passed away in 2000. His son Dan lives in the house Don built, and his son Donnie lives in the former Holisky residence. Many Shervin families still in the, live in the area and continue to enjoy the lake. Thanks, Sally. How about uh, Judy and Donnie? Judy Quist, Donnie Bryce? Okay. Um, Ella and Elma. Uh, I lived on the island my whole life, well, since I moved up north, but I was born in 1945. Okay? Mom and Dad ran the Mount Pavilion in 48 or 49, which is where. Beaches and the casino roller rink. Would anybody remember the little wow. casino roller rink? After the casino, we did the first time. We had a construction boat called the Zark, which I ran on Lake Mary Mata. Excuse me, would you put the mic right up to your mouth, please? Ah. And stand up. Okay. Uh, they never ran boats while they owned Ellen Elmas, but they had excursion boats called the Zark, and they ran them on the Zark. But anyway, getting back to early times, Mom did domestic house cleaning. She worked at Molded Products, worked at Cedar Engineering. Of course, Dad was on the Island Park Fire Department. He was the Island Park Constable. They cleaned the IP. Does anybody remember what the IP is? <laughs> <laughs> Island Park 
Mark Becker's dog, all right? He was a cement finisher, which he hurt his back while working on the Mets Stadium. So that ended his career as a cement finisher. Then he worked for the streets of Isla Park after El Bowl. <coughs> always, Daddy always made the best spaghetti sauce, doctored up the draw feed for the hamburger for field days, so he had to start a restaurant sometime. He did work for Uncle Pat at the Dello, and he worked in Jackson's Corner in Navarre. Where else? I don't know. He bought Chester Park for it and Tavern in 1957, the middle of my seventh grade. 1958, Manny and Barry were married, so Janet and I were stuck working the business. <laughs> Dad started having short order menu off hamburger, of hamburgers, french fries, and small steaks. A friend at school always liked beaten by me. She said, I smelled like donuts. <laughs> we lived upstairs where the grease smell was everywhere. <laughs> Mom and Dad always compared their daily receipts as to who made the most money, the store or the tavern and restaurant. So in the winter of 62, the middle of my senior year, they took out the store and made it all restaurants. So Al and Elmas really got going. I was so happy. I didn't have to work the store anymore and sell penny candy. My penny candy customers are behind you. They were behind you. Where they go? <laughs> then came the chores of the restaurant. I made quick tries with real potatoes peeling them and putting them through the french fry cutter, grinding the cabbage for coleslaw, making coleslaw dressings, french dressing, a frozen island, barbecue sauce, spaghetti sauce, cutting the whole heads of lettuce and tomatoes for salads, cutting his own steaks, grinding the ground beef for hamburgers and steaks. Their brown potatoes and garlic toast were the best. Everything was made in a thought when first started. Then I wished we had the store back. They bought most of their food locally, Axel and Bob's and Piggly Wiggly. Then they started buying the already ground coleslaw and lettuce and french fries. But he still did the potatoes for the brown potatoes, spaghetti sauce, barbecue sauce, coleslaw dressing. Then they donated the coleslaw for the Mount Fire Department fish fry and had to make cases for them and tartar sauce. So, guess who got stuck with that after he retired? By the way, my husband was on the fire department. They made the patio, they made the patio for the people to sit and wait to get into the restaurant. About 61 or 62, they put a cover on and so some could eat outside. Just when they bought Muriel Judd's house across the street, I'm not sure to the date, I know before 1965, the tornado. But before, yeah, so they, they bought it so they could buy, have more dock space for the boats that came this summer. In 67 or 68, they enclosed the porch. And the restaurant <coughs> is what it is in size now, except for the upstairs for the people, which is still odd for me to sit and eat in my bedroom. <laughs> I can say now, it never hurt me to work in store and restaurant and tell that Elle and Elmo are our parents. I could go on and on as to the events that happen while working, but really that's not only, that's only funny to the people working at the time, like Mona walking into the patio door, not knowing mom had closed it, so the two were fine. During a tornado warning, getting the people in the basement, which was wet and had many frogs. A minor fire was called in the kitchen, and Janet and Annie Maggie were the, were the cooks that night. And people know Maggie Rennie knows what I mean when I say it was hysterical. Another fire alarm, and had to get the people out, and our cashier, Ella, was collecting from everyone before they got into their cars. <laughs> so it's supposed to this happen when the folks are out for the evening or on vacation. It's 62 Excuse me. Nancy Janet and I really did our share working for them. 
I guess you could say it was a family business. Yeah, right. <laughs> All five of the show, grandchildren, Mike, Greg, Cheryl, Tim, and Cindy all had their turn working at Ellen and Elma, too. Of course, not for Grandma and Grandpa, but either for Bud and Eileen Nolan, who bought the business in 73, or the Giants, who bought it in 83. Also somewhere, my son-in-law worked for Ellen and Elma, too, but then didn't know who he was. Now getting to the fourth generation, generations, three or five of the great-grandchildren has worked at the restaurant, and two of the girls still do. I have always wondered what life, what, I have always wondered what if the folks had Bob Chesterfart, what life would be without Alan Elmas. Lifelong friends that we have all made here. When we have met one another, the neighborhood would have been quiet. People not getting lost, driving on the island and always asking for directions. I really didn't know how to live a normal life for a while having weekends off all the time when they sold. It was hard, fun, rewarding adventure for them, and we are so proud to say that Ellen Elmas is here to stay, and we do say, hey, they are our parents. Thank you. Doug East House, please welcome him. As I look out, I see a lot of, of familiar faces and uh, some new ones that I'm not familiar with, but uh, to me, there, there's three types of people in Island Park, and that is uh, there are captives, there's escapees, and there's volunteers. Uh, 54 years ago, uh, Donna and I uh, got married. I got drafted into the service. I thought I'd better do it. And uh, they put an announcement in the Mound Pilot. If you remember, the Mound Pilot was Abe Brazeman's paper. Uh, they said, Doug Easthouse weds Island Girl. They never mentioned her name. <laughs> she's, she's really been upset all these years. But I've come to understand it. Because I was a mainlander and I'm a captive. And, and there are some escapees, you know. The, the Shervin girls were escapees. They're, they're uh, Jim Bedell and, and uh, Chuck Williams. You know, they dragged them off the island. They didn't, they didn't come back on. Well, poor uh, uh, Mickey Mater was a nice young farm boy out in Bonnie. He met Lolly Johnson, and he's been on the island for 35 years. <laughs> There's volunteers like, uh, uh, you know, Judy and Donnie Quist. They both lived on the island, and, and, and Vanny and Barry Palm. You know, they volunteered to stay on the island. <laughs> but the thing that's so impressive is that uh, the reason you're all here, there, there's never been a community where people have had a passion for the area that they lived in. And uh, I've witnessed that through the years. It turns out that uh, Donna, <coughs> hi Donna. <coughs> turns out that uh, Donna comes from the Bryce family. Her mother was Maggie Bryce, who was a daughter of, of uh, uh, Alex Bryce called Scotty. And so uh, Doug Bryce was the oldest boy cousin, and Donna was the oldest gal cousin of the third generation. We had two daughters, Holly and Candy, and they went off and got a couple of mainlanders and brought them back in as captives. And so what it really means, they're raising our grandchildren on the island, and that's fifth generation Bryce's. So uh, I can tell you a little bit about the Bryce's. Uh, in 1941, uh, they were cited for three violations. <laughs> Fishing without a license, over their limit, and shooting a pheasant out of season. <laughs> and this was... Can you just stand right up close to yeah, the mic? Yeah, okay. And uh, this was in 19, 1941. But uh, in, the, in the Bryce family, of course, there's Lou Bryce, and I haven't, I haven't seen her tonight. I don't know where she is, but she's... Yeah. Hi, Lou. And uh, Lou and, and Oli Bryce are the, are the two Bryces left, left of the third generation. Uh, Oli is down in Florida, and Lou, of course, is here. 
but we had uh, we had Isabel and Betty, who were twins. They were born in Scotland. You know, in, in the Iversons have talked about the, you know a lot of Norwegians and everybody living on the island. I've driven all over the place, and I've never found a street called Ole or Ludifisk. <laughs> Neither one of them. <laughs> They're all Scottish names. So I think this. I think the Scottish people got here first. <laughs> Scotty Bryce had boats uh, down in Devon that they rented, and in those days, if you wanted to go fishing, there wasn't the demand for boats or dockage or high-powered motors. If you wanted to fish in Crystal Bay, you went over there, some guy had a few boats, and you could rent boats, and you had to row out to where he fished. Well, Scotty Bryce had, had uh, uh, several boats down in Devon that he rented out, and, and I know there was, uh, I've talked to Jim Scruton about this, and he denies it, but Scotty said, them, them damn Scrutons, they let my boats go again. <laughs> so, but uh, Isabel and Betty worked at the Hotel Del Otero. They were born in Scotland, but when they settled in the early 20s, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they being the oldest, they were working at the Hotel Del Otero. Uh, Al Jr. was uh, the third oldest. He was born in Scotland, and I guess Nikki was in the basket on the way. So uh, uh, then there was uh, uh, Jerry and, and Maggie and Huck and Johnny, Johnny being the youngest, and I guess they was great friends with the, with the Iversons, and they did a lot of fishing. Al Bryce, uh, you know, it was kind of funny. In those days, the people didn't value the lake shore because it, was, it took more wood to heat the houses because of the exposure to the elements. And if you look at the island, most of the uh, housing, the, uh, the early settlers, was in the core of the island around, around the park and where the village hall was. Uh, the Iversons settled there, the Bowles settled there, the Simers settled there, the Swensons settled there, and and you wonder why with the lakeshore today we, is so valuable and everybody's fighting for it. People didn't care in those days because if you had a boat, it was just a rowboat and there was no problem getting access to the lake. You could go tie it to a tree and go fishing whenever you wanted to. Today, lakeshore is $10,000 a foot and uh, dockage is, uh, is at a premium. There's a lot of controversy in the community about how do we get dockage on the lake. <coughs> Uh, Al Bryce lived right across from the park, and he probably was the sports director of the of the of the area. He had extra skates. He had the balls, the bats, uh, and he promoted everything, including golf. His uh, oldest son Doug <coughs> and Jimmy they were both active in sports, and Island Park in those days had a lot of good athletes. I mean, you could talk about. Ronnie Kahlberg, Emmett Screen, Emmett Screen, who lived on the island. His, his father was the mayor in 1930. And in fact, uh, what I did to broaden my knowledge of, of the early history of the island, because I didn't move on the island until 56. I was only been there 50 some years, but I didn't know much about the early history. So I went to the Hennepin County Library where they have on microfilm all the, all the uh, issues of the Minnetonka pilot from 1922 and it was really interesting you got a lot of a lot of facts and and uh, they talk about all of the athletes that that we had uh, that came out of the island Don Shervin <coughs> I, I got a list of the boys but I keep like the list keeps growing and growing and growing and I can't mention them because I forget somebody <coughs> and there were a lot of them I can tell you that uh, the competition, they had competition between Island Park, Spring Park, Mound, and Three Points. And it was intense competition. And the Island Park people and Three Points were very competitive, usually on the top. But in 1941, uh, I think uh, Island Park won the tournaments and they beat Mound 26 to six in a ball game with uh, Dick Fenton throwing a double play and Larry Betzler hitting a home run. Hey! <laughs> uh, 
in, in the pilot, reading some of the interesting stories, Witchwood Bridge had uh, the Witchwood Inn, and Donna tells me that on weekends in the 30s that her, the Bryces would go to the Witchwood Inn and raise whoopee. Well, <laughs> look, looking through the paper, there was an article about Valerie Cordello, who owned Witchwood Inn, and in 1930 they built the new bridge. Now the Iversons claim that when they came, they, they, they walked their cows across the creek to get on the island. So I have to assume that the channel wasn't dredged. So in 1930, they dredged, I'm assuming this, they dredged the channel because they raised the bridge. When they raised the bridge, they had to make their approaches uh, earthen roads that went up 10, 15 feet. In effect, what they did was they blocked off the whole north and east side of which would resort an inn. And if you come this way or go onto the island across the Witchwood Bridge and you look to your right, you'll see a rooftop there. And that was the Witchwood Inn. <coughs> so Valerie said that Hennepin County and building that road had spoiled their, thank you, had spoiled their access and visibility of their resort and she sued them for Hennepin County for ten thousand uh, dollars. Uh, it was just about three months later in the paper. The it came to trial and she was denied her suit, and she lost. She lost the lawsuit. She didn't get the ten thousand bucks. But if you look at it now, it must have had a terrible impact on the on the Witchwood Inn. <coughs> uh, another interesting story that I'm before I, the hook comes. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> I promised Gail I'd tell this story. Okay. I lived. I was raised in Navarre, about a block behind where the Snyder Drugstore is now, and, and just a little bit to the east of me was O'Malley's farm, and O'Malley had a nice barn and a hayloft and they had an apple orchard there that was all fenced in. And <coughs> Patty Jackson from Jackson's Corner had a riding horse, and so they pastured it in the apple orchard. And the, uh, so all of the mound girls that knew Patty would come to the apple orchard to ride her horse, if that was possible. And of course, that's where the boys went. Well, on the other side of the fence in Minnetonka Beach was this cute little blonde girl with long pigtails, and her name happened to be Gail Kloss. And Gail Kloss, uh, uh, she got in with those Grady's, and, and she had a whole bunch of Grady's. But <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a, a kind of amazing thing about her. Uh, she seemed to have a lot of horse sense. She didn't come into the orchard. And I always wondered about that. But as I was going through the pilot, I finally found out why. It turns out that Gail Grady, who is the daughter of Emma Kloss, husband of Frank Kloss, is Emma Kloss is not uh, an unknown. She is the daughter of Jacob Simerts. Now, that's the sister of uh, George Simerts. And you, most of you probably know George Simerts. But. So here, George Simerts was his uncle. And I gotta read this to you, it's too good. I gotta find it first. Here it is. I'll find it, here. You know, uh, it, this is uh, 1930. Talk in the microphone. This is 1930. You know, when you're dearly departed, leave this earth Sometimes they're passed, but in 1930, if you left, you were called. And Jacob Simerts from Mound was called. And he was born here over 64 years, and he died on that, on, in 1930. And he was well known uh, as a horse expert. And people came from all over the world to talk to him about horses. And in fact, his son, George and Henry, George and Henry were were hired by the government to select horses 
apparently during the, the, the First World War. So it says, yeah, they were, they worked for, because of their thorough knowledge of horses, assisted in judging horses for service in France during the World War. And then, uh, of course, he was survived by, by uh, his, his daughter, so, which was Emma Kloss, and his granddaughter, Gail Grady. So, <laughs> so the, I, I, I guess the moral of the story is that if you want to find out about doing business with the government and horses, you talk to Bill Simons. He's sitting back there. <laughs> if you want to learn about horsing around, talk to Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can pull the hook. <laughs>